excited to be here with Open Culture Foundation, Maji Nigeria, and Konoda to talk about um, Internet of Things and environmental sustainability. So uh, with that, I will pass the mic to Vasilis to uh, open us more into this conversation. Thank you, Shona. So uh, welcome, everyone. It's exciting to be here with uh, these uh, distinguished uh, guests. Uh, we have uh, with us Okoro um, Onyekachi uh, Emanuel from uh, Media Awareness and Justice Initiative, uh, or MACHI for short, from Nigeria. Uh, we have uh, Julian Casas Buenas from Colnodo, Colombia. And uh, of course, uh, Singing Lee from the Open Culture Foundation, uh, or OCF for short, from Taiwan. Uh, all these uh, three people are from uh, organizations which are uh, APC members. They have been working uh, a lot during the past couple of years, at least, for with um, uh, Internet of Things, um, uh, environmental sensing, uh, also collaborating uh, with each other. And it's a great pleasure and um, uh, a very, very good opportunity to uh, learn from their experience and discuss uh, with them uh, uh, with the knowledge and insights that they have from uh, their projects. Before uh, we, uh, before I give the floor to um, our guests, our speakers, uh, I would like to uh, direct a question to you, uh, everyone. Um, so. Um, I would like you to write um, something in the chat. If you are familiar with uh, IoT sensors, when you when you hear IoT sensors, does it does this ring a, a bell? So let's see. Uh, let's take a temperature in the room. Just write in the chat. Yes, no, uh, curious, whatever uh, fits uh, your current status. Okay, I can see some answers coming. We have uh, people who are definitely uh, very knowledgeable, some people who want to learn more, some are starting to get involved. Uh, okay, we have all sorts of yeses i don't see any no's here so which means that uh, probably uh, this uh, the people the group that we are here tonight or today uh, yeah we have an idea of what iot sensors are uh, this is great so we can discuss um, a bit on the specific um, implementation of this technology for environmental sensing. Um, so I would like to start with you singing, if this is okay, by asking you this question. Um, what are uh, Internet of Things sensors and uh, how are they used to monitor environmental systems like uh, air and water quality? Okay, hello everyone. I'm Cindy from Open Culture Foundations. For the IoT, uh, you can think about it Internet of Everything. So it's like everything with the Internet connection availability. So um, in your life, maybe you, your IoT is might be like the, your refrigerator, your air condition, or your vacuum cleaner. Um, these electronic uh, devices uh, in the past, uh, they don't have the internet connection availability. But now if they have the internet connection availability, you can turn on your air conditions before you go home with the internet. So it means that uh, we give the uh, those things uh, 
they have the ability to connect to the internet and you can use the website or application to uh, use it, to function it. Yeah, and for the uh, IoT sensor to monitor environmental system, it means like uh, in the past, uh, we will have like a big stations uh, to monitor the maybe uh, weather conditions, uh, those uh, weather conditions uh, stations, we need to have a manual, uh, a people to go to the station to record the weather, the, is, uh, the, and so on. And if it's with the internet connection ability, so you can remotely to know the weather, the rain, and it's more convenient uh, for us to monitor er uh, everything and uh, in the real time. Yes, that's uh, my short uh, intro uh, to the IoT and Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Xinying. And uh, yes, so you have given us uh, two, let's say, different points of view of this technology. One is from, let's say, the consumer point of view. So uh, how we can, uh, how IoT can provide um, the uh, possibility for you for users to uh, manage remotely their devices, uh, and also, let's say, the scientists uh, or the citizen science point of view which is uh, how this technology can be used uh, uh, bringing cheap equipment uh, easy to uh, deploy uh, to do stuff that uh, they, they were used to be done with very heavy and expensive uh, equipment not to say uh, that uh, they, this, this equipment replaces uh, what we already have, but rather I think more uh, it um, um, provides some additional um, capabilities. And uh, I would like to uh, ask everyone uh, on this, um, what uh, has been your experience with working with uh, the IoT sensors? And since uh, all of you uh, are um, members of activist organizations uh, in your countries. Uh, I think it would be interesting to know uh, what has been the impact of uh, using this technology for your activism. Um, and uh, Kachi, if uh, you would like uh, to start, then I can go to Julian and then to singing. Thank you very much, Vasilis. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Okuru Enikachi Emmanuel from the Media Awareness and Justice Initiative. Um, before I just give a short description of uh, our experiences, it would also be nice for, for people to understand the context of the Nigerian economy as it stands. The Nigerian economy is hugely oil dependent and this started in 1956, 1960, thereabout. However, the impacts of such huge industries has been on rural communities and on um, and then people's livelihoods. Poor rural people in hard to reach communities who are host communities of these oil installations across the Niger Delta region of Nigeria. And over time, activist organizations have been campaigning against um, the behaviors of multinational oil companies where they pollute lands, they pollute fishing areas, the livelihood uh, support systems are destroyed, ecosystem services are eroded, and most times these campaigns are used in a narrative style campaign. So we go there, we speak to them about it with no concrete information as regards the core issues that are affecting the lives and livelihood of these rural community people. But with the application of um, the use of um, IoT sensors, this has given activism in the Niger Delta a different view 
where we are able to use facts, numbers, figures, analysis, pulled from these sensors to be able to show you know, data verification of the visual impact that we see every day. Um, another experience is that it has given um, communities the, red, the needed data to engage these, comp these companies and demand for remediation, demand for restoration of impacted lives and livelihoods. Before now, co uh, companies have always said, we are, we are the facts. If we say we spilled 1,000 barrels of crude oil, we are the facts. And because there are no facts, and because there are no documentation of this type of issues, they, they, they go all on, all on, unpunished. And like they always say, the polluters don't pay. Um, and so because we're able to deploy these sensors, we're able to get water quality some, in some places, we're able to get air quality in some places. MAGI in itself has done deployed air quality sensors that collect this data and help. This data gives facts and provides the needed tools for more qualitative and quantitative engagement across, across, across the civil society spectrum. Thank you, Vasilis. Thank you, thank you so much, Kachi. It's uh, it's yes, it's a, it's a, um, an amazing uh, opportunity that uh, this tech gives um, groups like yours to actually sense the environment and uh, support uh, your uh, activism and your uh, um, advocacy and your uh, communication with uh, specific data, as you as you said. Uh, which is something uh, that also Colmodo uh, is um, experienced in. So, Julian, would you like to also share with us uh, the experience from Colmodo? Sure, Vasilis, uh, thank you for the opportunity as well to Open Culture Foundation uh, of uh, sharing our experience with uh, these uh, um, IoT solutions. Uh, we started recently, uh, uh, however, we have a lot of experience with uh, um, uh, sustainable uh, development and environmental um, uh, systems since uh, we are running the Sustainable Development Network in Colombia for almost uh, more than 20 years. So we are familiar with um, indicators, with um, uh, um, analysis of information, and we know how powerful it's uh, to have access to information. And um, uh, starting working with this project, um, uh, what we want to do is to combine it also with geographic information systems that uh, we are using uh, in, in the Sustainable Development Network. And um, uh, we want that uh, all this information that can be collected by the community uh, can be presented in a more um, efficient way. So uh, we will be able to provide these tools to activists that are already working uh, in protecting the environment and are very committed to mitigate climate change. Um, so also understanding the whole information process cycle, uh, uh, we believe will allow us to offer this type of services to all the interested uh, community, uh, because we see that there are many organizations that are producing information but um, it's not uh, public and is not shared uh, easily uh, through the internet and other tools. So we start uh, this project with um, understanding how the technology works and uh, uh, creating uh, like a laboratory of uh, how to set up um, Singing, can you uh, allow me to share uh, my screen again? Uh, I believe. Thank you. I want to show you uh, some of the 
uh, information that uh, that we are. Um, let me see. Let me share OG Electronics. Oh, maybe it's too small. No, we can see it. No, we can see it in a bigger uh, size. You you see it small from your side, but it's. it's okay. Small. Okay. No, 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 no. I know. Yeah. Okay. So, so what we have here is that we started to research about the implementation of the project, getting some information from uh, some of our partners. And uh, we start, for instance, uh, to uh, build uh, sensors uh, with, uh, for air quality and, and noise. And um, uh, we start uh, uh, to understand how all this device uh, works. So we uh, started with a controller uh, based in uh, Arduino, but at the end we realized that uh, it's better to, to get uh, ESP32 uh, as, um, as, uh, as the base of the sensor. Then we uh, uh, include a, a GPS. Uh, then we try different uh, noise sensors and we end up with uh, using the LM393 and also a real-time cloud so we can also include in the data all the information and uh, we start uh, also to record all the information in a, 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 um, um, in a micro SD card and uh, all the devices and a, a power bank we uh, um, uh, try different uh, options and uh, at the end, uh, with all the information that um, uh, we shared, we end up with a, um, uh, with a prototype for the sensor and uh, um, that um, uh, was built by our team. And uh, this is like the, 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 the result. And uh, we start uh, trying to um, uh, um, to, to, to create a set of data that is also usable um, and is related to the local norms so we can uh, uh, put that information in a way that can be, for instance, used for um, a campaigns or a, a advocate for um, uh, some uh, something in the future. Of course, of course, if we replace the sensor, uh, um, of noise uh, for other kind of sensor, we will be able to to produce uh, and to create uh, the information. So what we did with the sensor was uh, to bring it with uh, uh, people that works in Colnodo and to collect all the data and present it in a way that uh, we can understand where are uh, areas of uh, uh, more noise uh, we will be able to present uh, average of uh, of the noise uh, during the, the, the during the journey, or we can access uh, we can have access to all the information and download the data. Uh, so we believe that these kind of tools can be very useful to activists and to organizations working for protecting the environment. Uh, when we put all these uh, together in open source software, open data that can be used by anyone. So I believe the potential is very high. I will leave for there. Thank you so much, uh, Julian. This is so exciting. And uh, of course, this all has been possible uh, because there's now there's a the knowledge uh, that circulates through the internet, as you said, uh, you have been using open source software, uh, accessing open data, um, and of course, all the technology, the hardware technology that is available and cheap uh, in our days, the components that you can use to uh, put together and experiment in a do-it-yourself manner, which is, um, uh, bringing very exciting uh, opportunities, I think, for activists uh, throughout the world. Um, 
And then we also have uh, um, some, let's say, ready-made equipment or gadgets or um, uh, gear, environmental monitoring devices, which uh, OCF has also been using uh, with um, organizations across the world. So, um, Singing, would you like to also uh, share with us some of this experience? Okay, yes, uh, we have the same experience with like uh, Ju uh, Julian uh, talked before us. Uh, we are the organization that promotes open uh, source, open hardware, and the open data. And in our in Taiwan, the open source uh, community or CV tech community, they develop their equipments uh like air bus and the water bus to collect the open data and with this open data the tech community can collaborate with the let's say like the environmental uh, um, association or civil society or also organizations to do the uh, advocacy to follow environmental issues. And it's more like a cooperation between this. And I also can share uh, some maps. Uh, uh, it's an example uh, from Taiwan and uh, um, those, are, uh, those are our projects is from our CV tech communities. Let me share my screen. Okay. Uh, sorry, it's all in the Mandarin. So in, in the beginning, I didn't want to share, share the screen because it's all in the Mandarin, but I can share a little bit with it. Uh, we are more uh, in Taiwan. We have, uh, it's a hack song. It's a president, it's a presidential hack song. And in 2021, the last community, they have this kind of like a open source and a benefit good for the environmental monitoring network. And they cooperate not only with the government, but also with the like private sector, with the civil uh, society organizations. So it's a very pretty, I would say like it's a very smart uh, strategy to do it. Uh, they have the monthly uh, uh, public and private uh, cooperation meeting. So with uh, five public uh, organizations and uh, 20, more than 20 civil society organizations to join the meetings that discuss their uh, problem and they want to find the solutions and they can use the open hardware uh, uh, devices monitoring devices to uh, collect the data as well as they also use some uh, monitor sensor which is more expensive and the more uh, the, the data is more correct and it's a preparatory uh, hardware, but they collect data in the open data. So with the open data, uh, the civil society organizations, especially the environmental advocacy organizations, they can use the data to do the advocacy and also let uh, the government also know uh, the river data and that's easy for them to make the uh, to do the policy making uh, so this at uh, least two kinds of the open it's a open data and they have the water and so they, they collect the data in these uh, websites and so people can view it and uh, download it and it's the agency is from the 
water pollution agency in Taiwan. So it's a very, I would say, successful cases that uh, not only from the uh, civil society organizations, but also like the, our government is willing to uh, find a solution, cooperate with the private sectors. Yes. So let's uh, our cases from Taiwan. Thank you so much, uh, Xinying. It's very interesting to see this uh, uh, organization working with um, government uh, bodies, with the civil society, uh, with activists. I think uh, uh, this technology does uh, allow this to happen, and especially working with open data, I think uh, uh, this is something that enables others to uh, extract value from uh, the data that is produced. And of course, there's over, uh, always uh, the question of um, how accurate this data might be or uh, how correct they may, might, might be, which is, uh, yeah, it's, I think it's in its own right, it's, uh, it's a discussion that uh, is happening, but still seeing it as uh, complementary to whatever uh, other data is out there. Uh, I think um, uh, there is much value in, in that. Um, but uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, singing that um, um, organizations are using this open data to do advocacy with uh, uh, the uh, decision making bodies uh, around the environmental policy. So I was wondering if you could share some more uh, experience and um, knowledge from your uh, interventions on how this uh, environmental monitoring for air and water pollution can catalyze uh, climate action uh, by policymakers. Is this something that um, you see happening? Or if it's not happening, what are the barriers that arise for communities uh, to use this, this kind of approach uh, with local governments? And um, Julian, would you like to take this question uh, first? Um, this is uh, regarding to uh, the barriers uh, for um, or 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 uh, uh, related to real time environmental monitoring. Sorry. Uh, yes, this is about um, um, how this uh, environmental data that is produced, the real data through the sensors, uh, can you, can be used to catalyze climate action by policymakers. Uh, if this is something uh, that you have experienced, uh, people or uh, decision makers um, making use of this, uh, the insights that come out of this data uh, to support their action? Or if not, if there are barriers to that, what kind of barriers yeah. there are? Uh, well, what we have been uh, experienced and uh, that I mentioned already is that when you can have access to the information, probably um, uh, it's uh, more, um, opportunity to uh, get um, uh, governments and uh, organizations uh, uh, that is uh, in charge of uh, protecting the environment to take action. As uh, Okoro says, uh, with uh, no documentation, with no information, usually uh, there are no responsibles for all these situations. We have been working with uh, local organizations that are producing information that we know, but sometimes that information, for instance, is available uh, um, in, in, with a limited uh, way. And uh, what we want is to make sure that we can have control of the, um, uh, of the, of the um, wrong data that uh, you can also uh, be able to uh, uh, make some research, research from the data, and sometimes it's not easy 
to, to do that. Uh, currently, we are working, for instance, uh, um, with a, a small uh, project or a small test of, uh, um, uh, um, of uh, analyzing how we can uh, uh, present the information that is already uh, there. We did a, a small uh, exercise with um, uh, with Mahi, and uh, we get some information from air quality in uh, rivers in Nigeria. Perhaps if I can uh, share my screen, I can show you um, uh, the, the 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 way that we uh, uh, present the information that sometimes it's uh, very important, for instance, also to, um, to have the possibility of seeing how uh, things change through, through time. So in this case, for instance, uh, we can reproduce how uh, in a period of time, uh, the, the quality or uh, the, 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 the uh, of air it's in, in, in one sensor uh, at this time and probably we can create uh, data that uh, it's more uh, easy to understand for uh, the public or to share uh, with, uh, with others. Uh, um, so, so also uh, bring us to, to the question that I mentioned already, how important is the frequency uh, of the data that you collect. So it's uh, related to the local norms and then you can make some advocacy uh, from, 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 from this information. Um, we are starting, we know that uh, these tools can be also very useful. For instance, uh, with the community networks we are working with, and uh, for instance, uh, provide them the opportunity to make uh, uh, in the region that usually the community networks we work with are in rural areas uh, to, for instance, monitor air quality or uh, water quality. Uh, we want to uh, do this kind of uh, exercise using this kind of tools that uh, we believe that can be very powerful for organizations like that I mentioned, uh, Terrae, which are, uh, we are talking with them uh, in order to uh, um, use more powerful tools and, uh, and data that can extend their work uh, with uh, actions like uh, we see here, some results that they present in their website that it's based on uh, the information that they provide to the high courts in Colombia, so uh, to create uh, results about uh, uh, um, about uh, uh, for uh, uh, all these uh, uh, institutions uh, working with environment to protect the environment. So you can see here, for instance, some of the information they are providing that is uh, very basic. They don't have like a real information system. So we are working with them to make all this uh, information public so they can have more impact by sharing that information and, and to create probably more um, efficient ways to uh, uh, enforce the authorities to protect the environment. It's uh, interesting, Julian, that you're mentioning the, your collaboration with community networks, especially in rural areas. So I'm wondering um, if, uh, if, if rural areas uh, have um, some sp special barriers in using this technology uh, or um, what is your experience with that? Is there uh, an, uh, additional difficulties faced by people in uh, those areas to make use of this technology? Well, the main uh, problem at this moment is that they don't have connectivity at all. So, uh, for instance, if we manage to get the information in real time, uh, it won't be possible to get that information probably um, in, a, uh, um, um, uh, in, a, in a time that, is, uh, that you have probably the opportunity to identify 
uh, situation or something that is changing in the environment and uh, 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 connectivity is a problem. Also access to power. Uh, uh, most of these communities have uh, very unreliable uh, power from the power grids. So there are many barriers uh, here in Colombia in rural areas uh, to, to collect uh, this kind of information. Uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing this. Uh, singing, is this something that uh, sounds familiar also for uh, uh, your, uh, your country? Is this something that in Taiwan is uh, really happening as well in rural areas? Uh, yes, uh, I can show you an uh, example in Xinzhou. Uh, here is a map. Uh, this uh, white area is our Xinjiang uh, district, and this map is also developed by the last community. It's a civil tech communities in Taiwan, and the river is from like the mountain. This area is mountain to the oceans. And it's come across with like the rural area and the, to the cities. And also like this area maybe have the agriculture uh, fields in this area, but also Xinjiang is the, our high end technology, like science, there, there is a science, uh, te uh, science uh, technology park a uh, very important science technology park in Xinzhou, uh, which everyone is, might, uh, might be know the TSMC is for trip. So in Xinzhou, everyone is like to thinking about like uh, the water is from the mountain and it's very clear, fresh and without the pollution, but from the mountain, to like the city, uh, go through the uh, lunar areas. Uh, where is the agriculture in dust affairs? And did there any pollution in this kind of areas? And where is the livelihood areas? So this kind of map, uh, I can show you that this is the livelihood area so you can clear the living hood area and put any dust in here. So uh, you they can show you like, uh, is there any water pollution or any pollution in these areas? In this area, did there is any like uh, industrial factory or like agriculture factory? If yes, uh, they might be found any uh you might be thinking about okay uh, we need to watch out uh our river our river pollution yes yeah, so there's a uh, a lot of factory uh industry factory nearby this so uh as a citizen uh you it's more easy with this like visualizations you can know uh, about your river and uh, you can know about the water. The water is not only for drinking, but also like uh, for the agriculture and also for the like science uh, technology park. So yeah, in the beginning, uh, when the community, they come up, they came up this kind of, of ideas, it's because that this area is so complicated, but for our citizens, we just think that do, does we have any pollution in our waters? Is the, is the water we drink is okay? <laughs> yeah, did there is any pollution in it? So with this, this kind of map, we can know the, where is the river and it, does the river come across uh, the, pollution area and it is easy for people to monitor it. Yes, that's, and also it's easy for our policy maker 
to make the decision and to find out, oh yes, uh, this river come across these areas and uh, this kind of factor, they have the uh, like illegal uh, issues or they make the pollution. Actually, they have already made the pollution. So actually our government can go to find them and to check, to monitor, did they still uh, pollute the river? Yeah, this is the case from Taiwan. This is so interesting, uh, Sunyin. And uh, I can clearly see how um, data combined with uh, information on the local context, like the um, factories that you mentioned or the, the cultivating land that you have there, can be very powerful uh, as a tool for people to um, reach conclusions on what might uh, be the reason for, say, uh, water being polluted or not ideal for drinking, uh, which is, uh, I think, combines um, very much with what um, Julian presented earlier. Um, Kachi, uh, I would like to go to you uh, for this question next. So. Uh, um, do you have any experience to share? I, I know that you work also in rural communities, so um, maybe you can also share some, some of your insights from that work. Um, thank you very much. Um, I don't know if I could share my screen so I can um, show... Um, Yes, uh, so let me, let me go So for, for us in Nigeria, um, we had. Okay. Um, sorry. One minute, please. No worries, take your time. I can see it comes. Okay, come here. Can you, can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah, you can see it now. It says data cab. It says uh, data cab. Yes. Okay. Okay. You can see it now. Yes. Yeah. Now it's on. Okay. Thank you. Um, for us in Nigeria, we, and especially in River State, nice. For us in Nigeria and in River State, um, we've been having huge levels of uh, air pollution, and that comes from um, pollution from oil refineries, pollution from um, artisanal refining locations, and also pollution from, from gas flaring. And it got to a point where we had huge levels of pollution. And even when there were lots of engagements with the governor of River State, he never saw any reason why he should um, do any policy declarations. However, with the deployment of these sensors, we were able to collect data, especially from here. This, this is a sensor deployed in a committee called the Lelen one, which has had, before now, had huge levels. Now we engaged with the, with the media people, people in the in the radio stations, on air personnel, and shared this content with them, and used that information to engage with the governor. And based on the overwhelming evidence that these sensors showed different levels of pollution in different locations, he actually gave out an executive order to ensure that there was. Um, some level of uh, um, um, protection of, 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 of the public health. And this caused a drastic reduction in the, um, in the level. Now, in places like, uh, in places where, where, where we had huge levels before, um, what you have now is that it's gone down to moderate levels. In this kind of places, you had 
you had air quality sensors in the region of the red. Now it has gone down drastically to points where people are able to now come out and go around. You now have green zones and moderate zones in, in this area. So for us, the deployment of these sensors gave, gave us the, the factual basis to engage with this with the government and also go a step further to engage with relevant environmental agencies because they are the ones saddled with the responsibility of protecting the environment. And by the virtue of the executive order given by the government, we were able to work in tandem. Um, yeah, even in spite of all the good opportunities created by the deployment of IoT sensors, it's, it's important to also note that the barriers are also very challenging because in itself, um, Julian had um, mentioned internet connectivity. We, as Margie, deployed networks in about, uh, community networks in about three community networks that's covering about seven communities. And some of those communities have um, um, this, this deployed on them. What we have been doing is to hinge these IoT sensors on the community networks that have been deployed. Because some of these sensors also have their limitations. Some sensors have internal GSM devices where you can put in your local SIM cards, where you have GSM infrastructure. While some don't have, but they have Wi-Fi capability to be able to share collected information. However, the limitations here are in areas where they have limited or no internet connectivity, sharing data across GSM platforms become challenging. And then you now have to hinge those air, those air quality sensors on community networks that provide Wi-Fi access. Now, the question now becomes the sustainability of that community network to continually churn out information. Because from our experience, for you to make meaningful policy recommendations and push the government you have to have collected data constantly over a period of time and because of those shortfalls it becomes challenging to get full data that can be used to engage however with the deployment of these community networks this has helped to actually bridge bridge that gap um one other issue which i think has also as also a barrier is um is the is the is the issue of the durability of the sensors themselves it's um, in rural communities they are for example in nigeria they are very tropical areas where you have huge level of rain huge level of sunlight and all the weather factors that affect the device itself so the durability of that device in sometimes areas that are hard to reach becomes challenging and becomes a barrier in deployment of this kind of however on a whole, the use of these sensors has created the basis for us to be able to collect this data, which has been helpful. In July, in sorry, in February this year, Maji collaborated with a UK-based uh, um, human rights lawyer, uh, human rights law firm, that took. Um, upon them a case using data that we had collected over time and using the data that had been collected even while even while we have been doing our activism and doing our engagement with those communities and at the moment Ogale community which is one of the which is hugely uh, um, polluted uh, is currently in the supreme court in the uk bringing a legal claim against the spdc now, for us, that is landmark because SPC is a huge organization. It it's, it's, it's runs a joint venture with the Nigerian government. And because of that huge level of leverage it has, it goes, it, it, it does not adhere to certain environmental laws and policies. And this further affects the lives and livelihoods of people who live in the communities where their oil assets are. So this engagement has given us the opportunity to collect this data to use this data to engage with policymakers and also legally engage these multinational companies to, de to demand that they come back, they restore the environment, and they remediate impacted lands and impacted properties that have already been affected. So for us, this is a very this is very strong. 
and it's something that can be replicated. We have recently received um, a request from the University of Port Harcourt, who is looking for a potential for us when we expand to have more sensors deployed to use to use the data that those sensors are collecting for their um, environmental department in that school so they can use that for their research and data collection so for us this is how data can be used using these iot sensors to collect data and use that to replicate that data for research it's also very important for media journalists on-air personnel use these devices to be able to give update reports about about temperature about uh, 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 um, um, the quality of the air um, pm 2.5 deployment and how how i want the level of it and what kind of steps can be taken to protect people from the health impacts of those kind of things thank you Vasily. Uh, thank you so much uh, Kachi, and especially for giving us this great example uh, of your work uh, and the importance of uh, using the collective data to support such a strong case against uh, an environmental pollutant in your communities. I was um, reflecting on the um, uh, on, previ on the previous occasion when I was looking for data through the I think it was through the World Bank and uh, looking at the African continent, it really was. A, a black spot with relay in relation to uh, what data is available for uh, yeah, environmental data, but not only. So I think um, uh, producing and generating this data is not only something that is beneficial to uh, your local communities, but also, as you have also uh, said, Kachi, uh, it can be beneficial to for research and for other institutions so there is a lot of value to extract uh, in many different uh, situations um, so thanks thanks uh, for sharing uh, with everyone um, I would like now to uh, open the floor uh, to everyone for questions uh, to our uh, dear speakers or for any information from your experience with uh, using environmental sensors in your context so please if you if you wish to speak you may raise a hand there is a, a hand icon on the bottom right of your screen you will see it by pressing that it will produce a notification and uh, yeah, you can have the floor to uh, to share with everyone so um who would like to go I, can, I don't see any hands for the time being. You can also type in in the chat if you like, and I'm, uh, I will go through the comments. Thank you, Xinying, for, uh, uh, for suggesting. Yes, if you would like to speak, then you will uh, need to unmute your microphone. Maybe while somebody uh, wants to comment something, um, um, I showed uh, the document that we present for building this prototype. We went through different systems, different modules, and we are understanding that some are more reliable than others. And uh, it would be nice if we can share this kind of information um, uh, from from the different organizations that uh, we are uh, working with this kind of technology. So uh, perhaps we can go uh, to more stable or 
or understanding the limitations of uh, the different uh, uh, of the different uh, devices. Uh, we understand that uh, perhaps it's uh, uh, more efficient to to have a good um, a, a controller uh, rather than probably uh, save some uh, uh, money to uh, to to get uh, 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 cheaper ones, but then at the end, a uh, more reliable device will uh, perhaps uh, represent more valuable data and uh, more uh, data on a certain period of, of times. So we will share that uh, information that we uh, present today. And uh, uh, I think that uh, this will be very useful for the group uh, to um, see what kind of uh, devices are more uh, reliable or, or more um, uh, test uh, within the, the group. So we can probably have uh, better results uh, when building the devices. Uh, thanks a lot, Julian. Yeah, and it's it's important when since all this is possible through the open technologies, open knowledge, and open data is really very 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 good and really important that we keep building on this uh, open knowledge by contributing our own experiences. So documenting uh, what you do is, I think, it's really important for the whole community. Uh, I can see that Ahmad has a uh, hand raised, so Ahmad, please, the floor is yours. You, can, you need to just okay. press... Okay. Ah, yes, okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Ahmad. I'm from Indonesia. I work with uh, Common Room uh, in... Uh, school community network. I would I would like to ask from uh, all of you guys uh, regarding the IoT for environmental sustainability. I've been working with IoT uh, before, but not related with environment sustainability. I would like to ask uh, what kind of sensors do you use to monitor uh, environment environmental data, uh, especially related with uh, um, climate change, maybe, or uh, air pollution or water pollution. Uh, if you have any experience with that, I would like to know uh, about uh, the devices, uh, you, you, the, the device uses uh, in the uh, data gathering uh, or sensors or something else and the uh, second question um, recently uh, in uh, in rural area in Indonesia uh, uh, regarding implementation of the IOT uh, there are some uh, problem with the uh, lack of knowledge of the IOT and also uh the skills needed uh, to deploy the devices uh maybe from all of you have uh, experience with that how to how to tackle that burden with the uh, people uh, with no uh, skill in technology to deal with deploying the IoT devices. Um, maybe that's uh, the question from me. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. I think important questions both. Um, yeah, so I think the second, your second question relates to um, yeah, what what are possible starting points for individuals and communities interested in IoT sensors for uh, environmental monitoring? How could someone start using that, uh, especially if they don't have the experience? So, um, yeah, um, if, 
I can see that we are, we still have plenty of time, I think. So uh, yeah, whoever wants from our three speakers to take on the questions, uh, please, uh, grab the mic. Uh, yes, uh, singing. Uh Hi, uh, I can share for the second questions that for the people who don't have, uh, who has no skills for the IoT and how they use this kind of IoT to gather the data. And I can show you an example. Uh, let me share it. Yes. Uh, yes, this is the Max. Uh, it's a air bus, uh, uh, air quality monitoring systems. And actually, it's a open source, open hardware uh, devices. And in this kind of projects, they developed it in a very easy way. When you buy this back to your house, your home, or your office, you just need to plug in the the charge and then on and then link on the Wi-Fi, and it's easy for everyone to use it. So you don't need to uh, write any code, and it can uh, you just need to like link to the Wi-Fi so they can know the locations, uh, they can remember the locations of uh, this air bus. And then they will suddenly uh, push up the data to our open data uh, like platform. So the data will be automatically collected in uh, the data platform, the open data platform in Taiwan. So it's very easy for people to, uh, without any technology skills, but they can easy to use it. And they write down uh, a little bit uh, manual for people to troubleshoot things. So it's also a example for this. And actually we have, a uh, different experience in the water uh, bus. Uh, the water monitoring, water quality monitoring devices is very, I would say it is very difficult, is very complex. And to me, I cannot uh, understand or I cannot um, uh, do it by myself. So, uh, with this kind of water quality uh, devices, it's not easy for us to promote everyone to use it because the process is they have many steps in for for before you use the water quality devices. Actually, I learned it for two workshops, but it's very difficult. For me, I not have the technique technology backgrounds, so it's very difficult to understand or to remember every steps. And so, uh, for that cases, uh, I found that uh, it's a little bit you said uh, many failed or no, uh, not such a popular like a. Uh, uh, quality monitoring uh, devices uh, in Taiwan. So that's my experience. Thank you, Xingying. Um, I don't know if any uh, from the other two speakers would like to also um, provide some information on that. Uh, Kachi, please, please. All right, um, thank you. Um, just to also add to what Sengin had, had said, um, I will say that to respond to Ahmed's um, first question, I think more or less uh, communities need to be involved more 
in demystifying or in removing the the big elephant, or that is the use of IoT, probably by teaching them how how to build these devices from scratch, and uh, probably you know helping them to 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 work within them using these devices within their own context, because in some places water monitoring could be more of importance to them than air quality monitoring in places like river state air quality monitoring is as important as water monitoring so they can adopt these devices to to fit within their own climate impact realities and use that to be able to develop their own narratives campaigns and advocacy um, it's also helpful um, to have uh, them to be at the front, the middle and the center of, of this, of, of the campaigns. Um, what we have found, our experience has been that uh, once communities are involved in the development process of the campaigns around deployment of IoT sensors for environmental protection and environmental campaigns, we tend to find out that the communities absorb this and more or less create the sustainable environment for that project or that activity to run without us having considerable input into it anymore. And we can now only support them by helping to expand this project and then or expand the activities or expand the options that IoT sensors bring. And by so doing, give them more opportunities to engage with policymakers and have their voices heard. Um, I also see one question from Gustav, which I just want to answer before I go off. I think that's number sure. one. Mm -hmm. Number one, yes. Um, mostly, what we do is that we go to the communities and have an, a very interactive session with them, where we discuss, where they tell us their climate realities. They tell, them, tell us how much impact they face, and they tell us what they intend to achieve by the campaigns that they hope to do. Because we might go there with our own objective, but the communities have their own objectives that are tailor-made for their own reality. So once these two objectives are aligned, we are able to bring the technical capacity, and they are able to bring the community support base for these two to connect. And once we use the ideally, as Julian had mentioned earlier in the presentations about connectivity. Even when you deploy the community networks within the communities themselves, the communities are the people who protect the support base for that community network to become sustainable. And by so doing, they can now deploy their IoT sensors and then use the data that can be used for their own engagement. Also, one thing that's also very important is language. When you look at the Data, the data numbers or the narratives, like the, 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 the way data is presented, is very ambiguous. And for people who are not hugely educated, this can be a barrier. This can be a challenge for them to be able to create sustainability for that particular engagement. So we, we train young people and help them use, help them understand what type of data is being presented and that data is then interpreted and shared using local platforms like town hall meetings like sms uh, like uh, sms systems to mobile phones and sometimes by also interactive engagement with community leaders and uh, community uh, uh, governing groups that help to manage these rural communities thank you julia Thank you, Gachi. Um, uh, great points, uh, I might add. Um, uh, we also have three questions there from Gustav. Uh, for uh, any of the um, speakers that uh, want to address them. So the first one is uh, how to initiate and develop citizen science projects that allow people to be actively engaged with IoT sensor development for environmental monitoring. Uh, are there in particular steps to doing that? And Kachi just shared some of uh, 
right? Just experiencing that. The second question is how, how can we develop IoT device with common standards on the device and the environmental data? So standardization about the technology and the produced data, which is also an important issue. And the third question is, uh, is there any regulation in your country for environmental data standards that can be released publicly? So any of these questions that you might want to address, please feel free. Um, Maybe I can comment some um, from Gustav questions. Well, um, we are in a very like um, uh, starting phase of using the IoT technology sensors, uh, but we have uh, a lot of experience in um, environmental indicators and uh, things like that because we were the operators for instance of the uh, Bogota Environmental Observatory which collects a lot of information about indicators of uh, different issues in, in the city. In a very large city like Bogota which is more than 8 million uh, citizens so what uh, we see is that um, uh, it's important to take into account uh, all the um, regulation norms and all the metadata that is um, uh, required for environmental um, uh, data. Uh, what I'm saying is that uh, maybe we can collect the information but we have to make sure that the way we are collecting, it's uh, in some way that we can compare with the um, uh, local rules, the, the local way of, uh, uh, yeah, of uh, measuring, for instance, air quality. So uh, it's uh, that information need to be every uh, minute, every hour, every day, uh, whatever it's uh, then uh, um, useful to compare with the uh, uh, local norms is very important. Uh, so you can um, uh, refer and present the information that uh, and compare, for instance, with the local norms. So that for us, it's important. What we did was to start getting information from the devices, but then um, adapt uh, the frequencies and all the information that then we can compare with, uh, with these norms. That is one of uh, our recommendations. And um, regarding, uh, yeah, regarding regulation, I think that's, that's uh, uh, important to, to when, when starting this kind of exercises, I, I think it's important also to, to think uh, uh, about these formats and, and, and about the frequency and uh, understanding the metadata that uh, you need to, to, to use uh, so the information will be useful in the future. Otherwise, probably you will get a lot of information that probably you cannot use to uh, a campaign or uh, easily the uh, policymakers or the authorities will tell you that uh, you didn't uh, 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 took into account uh, this uh, for the uh, information you you gather and and then it will be probably not useful all that uh, efforts. Great, thank you so much, uh, Julian. And I can see that also um, Placido has also shared the link uh, for the uh, environmental standards in Colombia. Thanks, uh, thanks for this Placido. Uh, Singin, please, yes, the mic is yours. Yes, um, uh, I would like to share about the experience in Taiwan is like, uh, if you want to the first step that the gathering people in this kind of civic tech or citizen science projects, I, I think that make the room uh, 
public and uh, open. It means that every time you need to take the notes for everyone, uh, they can read it and they can know more information about these projects. And uh, you don't, you not only need engineers in your projects, but uh, you also let recruit some like data scientists or uh, data visualizations uh, helper in your projects. So you can also think about how to promote your project to others. And I, I think that uh, the important thing is that also cooperate with the government. The government also needs this kind of chance to uh, change their strategy, change their policy. In Taiwan, we I can give you an example. It's more like we have this kind of low prices devices, or you can think about it's uh, like a consumer devices. Everyone uh, is affordable to buy it and you can put it in your house, in your office, even uh, the, the, the schools, the elementary schools, uh, they bought it and put it in the campus. And with these low uh, cost devices, we can know the trend of the air qualities. And with, with uh, after we collect the data and uh, we know the trend, we can have more um, high levels of uh, uh, air quality monitoring devices that with the certification from the Environmental Pollution Agency. And this kind of more, uh, this more uh expensive than the low cost devices these kind of devices they can tell you uh the situation in these areas and with these devices the agency they can make the policy decisions and they can find the uh, pollutions so i think that it's more like a win-win strategies and with different level different prices levels of uh, devices and we can use it to trace our pollution in uh, in our life this was yes, a, that, that's my theory this was a great example singing thank you thank you for sharing that yeah uh, citizen science uh, can play such a uh, such a role like um, providing some insights on places where more uh, let's say um, professional equipment can be set up to uh, monitor uh, the uh, location um, we still have seven minutes left for this meeting of ours so there is some time left if there are any questions from uh, from you still uh, so if you have any remaining questions this is the time uh, to raise a hand or to type in in the chat and then we will slowly go towards closing um, this meeting for, the, for tonight uh, and I'm, as I'm talking I'm going through the notes to see if we have missed any question from you there There is uh, some uh, quite some information shared in the chat also with relation to what specific types of equipment you have been using in your uh, installations. So uh, uh, I'm not sure if everyone has the possibility to save the chat. I can I can save it, uh, but probably I'm an uh, moderator of this uh, session. Perhaps uh, uh, Lee can uh, shed some light here. I'm not sure if everyone can, but in any case, if you need any information on the chat, you can just copy copy that.
I can see that uh, Gachi has shared a link to their uh, devices, well, one of their devices, uh, which is great. And uh, thank you, Wagen. Uh, we are actually having a, an announcement about OCF's seminar. Uh, so since there are no more questions, Singing, would you like to uh, take the mic and let us know about this uh, seminar that we're organizing? Yeah, thank you, Vasis. Um, we were gonna to have uh, events in Bangkok is September 4th in Bangkok and we have uh, online registrations and it's a forum uh, we have uh, two parts and the first part is that we uh, are going to share our experience last week we work with the AIT University in Thailand, uh, how we use uh, the air quality devices and uh, how it uh, make the city digital transformations. And the, in the afternoon, we also want to uh, invite civil society organizations together and to come up like uh, what uh, how the IoT can help us uh, to do the environmental advocacy. It's just like today's uh, events, and we want to talk more in the in our September's uh, events. And I know that today's probably we don't attract any attendees from Thailand, but. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, this e event is in person, but uh, we will try our best to uh, make sure we can record the event so that we can also share the videos to everyone and uh, you can hear about some uh, solutions, IoT solutions from commercial products as well as some uh, advocacy strategy from civil society organizations. And um, please help us if you have any connections, networks in maybe in Thailand or Southeast Asia, they might be interested in our forum. And please ha also help us to share the link to them. And at, uh, following on the uh, on the Thursday, we have the forum. On the Friday, we have like a workshop. And it's kind of workshop is to talk about how to use the data, uh, lots of open data. And uh, the AI is, uh, nowadays the AI is uh, very uh, popular topics. So we are also gonna to, uh, going to share uh, the experience how to use AI to uh, to to uh, help you to uh, make your visualizations. So it's uh, all about our sharing, and it's so yeah. Please help us to share the link. And also, wait and share the information uh, in the chat box. Thank you, Wei Chen. Thank you, Xinying. Um, Wei Chen has already shared the form, uh, so you might want to keep the link and um, share that with any contacts that you may have in Taiwan or if you're traveling there. Um, it's been exciting having everyone uh, in this uh, discussion today. Um, I would like to thank OCF for uh, organizing, the speakers for being here and sharing their experience, and all of you for taking the time to, uh, to be here, to ask and uh, share your uh, knowledge and considerations. And um, um, I wish everyone a great weekend ahead. And, um, Thank you again for, uh, for being here.
Thank thanks you so much. everyone. Yes, thanks singing. Thanks so much, Julianne and Kachi and Vasilis and everyone for being here. Um, if you're not already connected with us um, and want to follow up on this, please feel free to leave your email address in the chat and we'll make sure to follow up with you um, on the um, this discussion and any next steps that might happen um, based on this discussion. Thanks so much, everyone. And thanks, Vasilis, for facilitating. Thank you all for organizing this and hope to keep in touch and continue sharing all these experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Shona. Thank you, Vasilis. Thank you, Singing. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And um, I hope we do more of these interactions because I've also learned and um, this really helped. Thank you again and do have a wonderful weekend.